and send me the WhatsApp information, please, so I can um so WhatsApp me from you from the group WhatsApp, and then I will send the the lecture to you all, right? And let me give you my um UTEC email as well. That one I can send anytime. Right, so you should see it there as well. So remember, feel if you have a problem, feel free to contact me. Nine o'clock to nine o'clock, I will be available. Um, well, I'm if obviously if I'm in a class, I can't pick up, but um, otherwise, I'll answer you, right? So if you call me, you don't get through. I might be in a class, so wait an hour and call again, right? But most days. I should not be in a class between 9 o'clock and um, 11 o'clock this semester. So if I come in between 9 and 11 most days, you will get me, right? Or send me an email. Normally within 24 hours, I'll respond to you. Okay, um, let's move on. So remember, WhatsApp me as soon as you can so I can send you the, um, the PowerPoint. You know, just in case. We never know. Anyway, cardiovascular system. Well, blood was starting with, right? You should be seeing my screen, hopefully, right? All right, so let's do slideshow. Now, as you all are... Wait, let me shift this. As you all know, blood itself is a connective tissue, right? Everybody remembers that from AMP1, right? It is considered to be a fluid connective tissue. Now, like all connective tissues, blood has to have specific components to it, right? In order for it to be a connective tissue, and see if everybody remembers this, you need three major components. You need some kind of cell. And of course, we all know that there are two major types of cells in blood. You have your red blood cells and you have your white blood cells, of course, which of course are the, the leukocytes. You know, there's some c sex so we're, we're fully aware of this, right? And you need a matrix of some sort. Now, the matrix of blood, of course, is going to be the plasma, right? So that's the liquid part of the blood. But who can tell me what is missing in order for this to be a connective tissue? So we need a cell, we need a matrix, and we need something else. Does anybody remember? Fiber. You need fibers, exactly. So what is the fiber in blood? Fibrin, sir. Fibrin or fibrin. Gen? Oh. Fibrinogen is the insoluble form of fibrin, so I will take both. So you're absolutely right. So that is what makes blood a connective tissue. It has cells, it has matrix, and it has fibers, right? All right, great. Off to a good start. Now, in terms of what blood does, its actual functions, once again, these are things that you're aware of from CSEC days, right? So you know blood's... His main functions are going to have something to do with transport. Transport of dissolved gases, of course, we normally talk about dissolved gases, we mean oxygen, obviously, and carbon dioxide, right? Um, there's nitrogen and other gases in, in there, but they're not so important to us, right? At least not at normal atmospheric pressure, right? Um, now, nutrients... Obviously, whatever you digest in their intestines has to be taken from the intestines and spread to the rest of the body, which, of course, means the easiest way to do this is to drop it in the blood and it gets carried all about. Okay, Hormones. Most of your hormones are transported in the blood as well. So your the, the, the lovely thing about blood is that you can make a hormone in, in, in some part of the body. For example, your thymus gland in your neck here you can make th you can make thymosin and other hormones, right? Your pituitary gland in the in the in the head, 
you can make hormones there and then move them into the blood and then from there they can spread to the entire body right so everything doesn't have to be local and of course our metabolic waste now can i ask you all to name me three types of metabolic waste that is transported by the blood can you name three types of metabolic waste transported by the blood this one should be easy urea one urea. is urea absolutely urea is one need two more urea is the easy one um carbon dioxide you make carbon dioxide that's also metabolic waste mm -hmm. is lactic acid one lactic acid is transported to the liver where it is broken down i agree with you nice very good all right um Another thing blood does is it regulates the pH and ion composition of not only the blood itself, but also of interstitial fluids. Now, hopefully everybody remembers interstitial fluids. I mean, functionally, they're the same as um, tissue fluid. Functionally, not, not, ex not exactly, but close enough. So these are the tissue, the, the fluid that you'll find around the tissue. When there's too much Sodium, for example, you know, around a tissue, it's in the fluid, that excess sodium can move into the blood and then be carried from by the blood and deposited, for example, in the kidneys and the kidneys can get rid of it, right? If there's not enough sodium, the kidneys can move sodium into the blood and then that sodium can be carried to whichever part of the body needs it, right? So the blood allows us to move around ions to ensure that the ion composition of different parts of the body is where it needs to be, right? If I say the term set point, does everybody understand set point? You all have heard it before? No, okay, sir. But... No, sir. All right. Um, the thing is, with, with, with um, CSEC teaching, it, it, um. The quality of the teaching varies from institution to institution. They may not have heard it before. Set point has to do with hormones, right? Um, basically, you, they're, they're the characteristics that are required for different parts of the body to be maintained have a specific level that you need to keep them at, right? So, for example, um, the pH in the stomach has to be lower than the pH in the large intestines, right? So there's a set point for the pH. And the body tries to maintain that set point, right? It's a part of homeostasis. The blood is supposed to, construct, you know, supposed to contain a certain percentage of water. And it, your body tries to maintain that percentage of water. And that is another example of a set point. The amount of salt in the blood that your body wants is a set point, right? So whatever characteristic it is that your body wants to maintain at a certain level, that level is called the set point, right? So, sir, uh, sir could you um interchange that word for optimum, like an optimum point for an optimum amount of salt that the body needs? Well, set point is not just for salt. It's pretty much for any characteristic. Right. No, man, no, I was just asking if you could just interchange the word set point for optimum. The thing is, set point is one of those recognized terms that if you say to a, a doctor, boy, the, pay, the set point is X, Y, Z. Everybody knows what you're talking about, right? So if you said the optimal pH, for example, of blood, I would absolutely understand what you, that you mean set point, right? But... um. Realistically, you, you probably should use the term set point since it is, it is the accepted term if you want to keep it, if you want to think of it that way, right? But I do understand. And if, if you had indicated the optimal level of X in the blood is whatever, I would mark it wrong, all right? But set point would be preferred. Anyway, so there's a set point for pH in the blood versus in the stomach, right? I'm assuming everybody knows that the set point for blood pH is somewhere around 7.35 to 7.45, right? So your blood is supposed to be a little alkaline, right? Now, because your blood is a slightly alkaline, 
when somebody says that a person's blood is acidic, it doesn't mean like the blood is like five or 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 or, or six or whatever, right? A pH of six in the blood would kill you. I mean, it could be as simple as a pH of seven point three or seven point two eight. And they say, boy, your blood is acidic. Am I boy? Are you mind setting yourself? But wait. If seven is neutral, seven point two is alkaline. So what they're telling me is my blood is acidic. It is acidic in comparison to the set point. Right? Your normal pH is supposed to be 7.35 to 7.45. If you say if your pH drops down to 7.2, it is acidic in comparison. Please. So keep us in mind, right? Now, blood also restricts fluid loss at injury sites. So simply put, when you get a cut or a scrape or a, in, since we're in Jamaica, a stab or a shot, and you start leaking out, your blood has mechanisms to minimize the loss of blood to keep fluid in the body. And keeping fluid in the body is extremely important when somebody dies of a gunshot wound or someone dies of being stabbed or even dies because they say they're in a traffic accident and their arm gets torn off they don't die from the injury they die from the loss of blood right once your blood pressure drops below 20 percent of normal your heart starts to beat erratically. And if blood loss continues, your heart will eventually simply stop beating. So a low enough blood pressure will kill you. So therefore, keeping the blood inside the, the, the blood vessels is extremely important, right? So the, of course, it means your blood has to have a way of sealing wounds. All right, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit, right? Your blood, of course, also has to help to defend you against pathogens. So, and the toxins that pathogens produce. So when somebody has a, in, has a bacterial infection, the presence of the bacteria itself is a problem, sure. But what really causes the damage is not the bacteria is being there because you have lots of bacteria in your body, right? But the fact that these bacteria are producing waste that is poisonous to you. So, for example, cholera. It is the poisonous waste of the cholera bacterium that triggers the events that will lead to your death. If the cholera is floating around and not producing any poison, and, you know, eventually your body would learn to live with it and it would be a problem, right? So your, your immune system, therefore, works with your blood to neutralize pathogens. And remember what a pathogen is. A pathogen is a disease-causing organism, <clears throat> right? So a pathogen can be a, anything that gives you a disease. So it can be a bacteria. It can be um, a virus. It can be a worm. I'm sure everybody's, everybody when they're young, your mother used to give you worm medicine, right? But um, things like um, a mosquito cannot be a pathogen. Does that make sense, everybody? You understand why a mosquito can't be a pathogen, but a bacteria and a virus can be a pathogen? Make sense? Yes, sir. The, uh, the mosquito is a vector. Mosquito is a vector. So what the mosquito does is the mosquito delivers the, the a organism. Vector, a vector that carries it. The... Keep going. Keep I going was just there. saying that the mosquito is a vector that carries the pathogen to the host. Exactly. So the mosquito itself can't give you symptoms. It is the pathogen it carries that is going to end up giving you symptoms. Right. Now, stabilization of body temperature this is an interesting one. As you all know, human beings are homeothermic. We like to maintain a set body temperature. Right. Now, that said, most of the heat that we generate comes from our liver and our muscles right then now the blood that is flowing through the muscles and flowing through the livers gets warmed up and that warm blood then can go to other parts of the body we all know that the human body temperature is supposed to be like 37 degrees celsius or something like that right 
That said, if I take a thermometer and I check different parts of my body, I am not going to get 37, right? If you check on a cool day when you check your fingertips, you might get 36, right? Check on your arm, you get 38. Because, of course, heat dissipates more quickly from different parts of your body. But the, the majority of the heat is generated by your, remember, your liver and your muscles and then spread from there. So even if your fingers are cold, it doesn't mean that your body in general is cold, right? All right. Now, blood, of course, I'm sure you all know this, is made up of three easy to separate parts. Two easy to separate parts, which are plasma, right? And what we call formed elements. Or in some books, they us call them cellular elements, right? Now, the form elements are going to be your red blood cells, your white blood cells, leukocytes, and your platelets. Whereas the plasma is basically everything else, okay? Now, plasma itself is going to contain mostly water, no surprise there, right? But it's also going to contain proteins, blood proteins. So about 7% of the volume of the plasma is going to be blood proteins. And proteins in the body are extremely important. Most of the functional um, reactions that your body has, your metabolism, right? And even to help to maintain homeostasis, there's some protein involved somewhere along the line. So proteins are super important. So the ones in the blood, therefore, must be super important as well, right? So our 7% um, proteins can be broken up into three main groups of proteins. We have albumins, and about half of the proteins in the blood are going to be albumin, right? So half of the 55, so 55 percent of the seven percent will be albumin. When it says you're maintaining blood volume, it's talking about homeostasis. Helps to maintain the set point for blood uh, volume, right? So the albumin helps to keep water in the blood, so your blood doesn't um, get too thick. Obviously, very thick blood, hard to pump, so there's a problem, right? Albumin, very important. You also have globulins. Now, what is another word term for immunoglobulin? You all have heard it before. Immunoglobulin. What's the other word for immunoglobulin? It's right there on the slide. Antibodies. The antibodies. Yes, it is. So immunoglobulins and antibodies are the same thing, right? So 38% of the proteins floating around in your blood are antibodies. And as, as I'm sure you all know, the purpose of antibodies is, of course, to fight infection, prevent infection, alert the blood when there is an infection, you know? Everything to do with protecting you from pathogens. The antibodies are good for that, right? And in the smallest percentage now is going to be fibrinogen. Now remember, fibrinogen is the inactive form of fibrin. Fibrin is what clots the blood and helps to prevent the loss of um, blood when you get caught, right? You don't need a lot of it, right? So around 7% of the proteins are fibrinogen. Now, why don't you need a lot of it? The purpose of the fibrinogen is to make a net, okay? Or a mesh and trap blood cells in the mesh and then the mesh gets pushed into an open wound to plug the wound. Right? You don't need a lot. So to, to make the mesh, the mesh is mostly basically space. So you don't need a lot of fibrinogen to make a mesh that can catch the red blood cells to help close the wound. Right? Now, other things you'll find in your plasma, it is about one and a half percent. It will be electrolytes. Can I, I assume everybody has heard the term electrolyte before? Um, they used to be people used to be selling electrolyte everything recent uh, the other day. I, I guess I cannot stop. 
but what are electrolytes really? Electrolytes are ions used by the body, once again, to maintain set points, right? And remember why these set points are important. These optimal points or set points allow your body to um, function at its most efficient level. All right? So it allows some metabolic reactions to occur at their best rate, right? Which means that your body functions best when it is at its set point. So let's say, for example, um, you, I don't know if any of the, maybe football is around me. You go for a run, right? Or you play netball or football or basketball or whatever sport you people play, you know? I, you know, obviously I'm not a sport person, right? Now, let's say you run around for, for 45 minutes. Then you come back, you're offered a bottle of water or a bottle of Lucasade or Gatorade if you have money, right? And again, these days the price is almost the same. Um, when you drink the straight water, yes, when you sweat, you lose water, fair enough, but you also lose minerals in the sweat. As a matter of fact, if you if you exercise heavily and you drink water, straight water, it's actually worse for you than if you didn't drink any water at all, which sounds a little weird. I mean, if you're losing water, you need but water, right? But here's the thing. When you drink that pure water without having your electrolytes, which is your sodium and your potassium and your calcium and you know, all the other ones that you would have sweated out, what you're doing is you're diluting your blood. Right? So you're diluting the blood now. As we normally say, you're increasing in the osmotic pressure of the blood. Right? And that in itself affects your homeostasis. So you will find that if you drink a lot of water after heavy exercise, you actually feel worse than if you didn't drink any water at all. So what you're supposed to do is drink something with electrolytes in there, So which is why the Gatorade is better than the water, because the Gatorade has water in there for sure, but it also has the sodium and the potassium and the calcium and all of these things, which means that when you drink the water, it is not going to change the homeostatic balance of your blood. Hopefully that makes sense, right? By the way, you don't have to drink Lucozade. I mean, it can be something as simple as drink your water, but eat something with salt in there at the same time, and you'll be fine. All right? Uh, Nadia, you have a question? Or Gatorade. Gatorade expensive. Gatorade expensive. Um, something as Coconut water. Coconut water. Listen to me now. Coconut water is one of these weird things. Coconut water is naturally at almost the exact set point of um, human blood. It is strange, right? What that means is that coconut water is so good. During World War II, when soldiers would get shot and they would be bleeding out, they need something to replace the blood before the blood pressure gets too low and they die. They used to put coconut water in the IV bags and put coconut water straight into them. I would keep them alive. So yeah, coconut water is is, is practically perfect. Right? So you're 100% correct. Um, Bottled water will have some amount of electrolytes, yeah, but they're not going to have the proper um balance of electrolytes. All right? Keep that in mind. Um, As a matter of fact... I have a question. Uh -huh. Go ahead. You were saying earlier that we should... It's better to drink something with salt or a little bit more salt in that when we are finished exercising or any strenuous activity, right? Yeah. So, like, you know, like the rehydration um sauce that they give you? You plop one of those in the water like and you drink it, you're good to go. Okay. I mean, that's why it sounds... But think of it. Your rehydration sauce. You're giving people salt to rehydrate. That doesn't make no sense. But that's the reason for it. Because if there's too much water in the blood without the, with the proper balance of salts, you actually feel worse. But you can make your own kind of Gatorade if you know you're going to exercise. All you need is eight ounces of water, two scoops of glucose powder, um, a third of a teaspoon of salt, right? And for the most part, you're good to go. I mean, it's not going to taste great. I mean, you can add a little um, sugar to it. 
remember glucose powder doesn't really um glucose doesn't taste very very sweet right so if you add a little um a, 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 a tablespoon of um, regular sugar to it and by the way brown sugar because brown sugar will have um, magnesium and other things in there you mix that up that's almost as good as gatorade right and for the most part it's like one tenth the cost anyway now um let's talk about the blood part Oh, obviously there are hormones and vitamins in blood as well. So you know. Now, the formed elements. Now, everybody knows platelets are associated with um blood clotting, right? But there's another process called platelet plug formation that happens more often, which we are going to discuss in some detail. Okay. Now, platelets. Less than one, as I said, platelets and white blood cells are less than one percent of the of the um blood volume. So there's not very many of them, but you don't need a lot of them to do what you do. The purpose of platelets is to trigger the clotting process, right? They start it off, and once it starts off, they can sit back and then let the rest of um the the the, the um components come together, which is why you don't need a lot of platelets, right? Now, the largest component of the formed elements, no surprise, are going to be your red blood cells. So 45% of your blood cells, of, of um, your, the 45% is uh, red blood cells. Is That's a total a volume of, let me restart. Your red blood cells take up 45% of your whole blood, right? Plasma, 55%. And of course, you have the white blood cells that, and the platelets so that will come along as well, right? Now, as you all know, your um, red blood cells are going to be packed with hemoglobin, which is a protein whose main function, of course, is transport, right? We'll be looking at the hemoglobin molecule in very limited detail later. All right, so that's our overview. Now, I don't know if you all have been to the hospital. Well, I mean, you're, you're nurses. You must have been, to, have been to the hospital. But I think they don't they normally give you a, a tour through the blood bank. At least they used to. I don't know if they still do it. Um, you all been to the blood bank yet? No. Okay. I thought um, Moby Hospital had a, had a blood bank down there. All right. I mean. They I guess do. We have not been there. Hmm. Huh. I guess you'll, you, I guess you'll get to it. Maybe it's next. Maybe it's the next year thing. But you know, here's how you separate the blood. It's very simple. All you have to do is draw blood from the patient, and then you put it in a centrifuge. What a centrifuge does is spins very rapidly, right, and it forces the formed elements down in the bottom of the tube. So that is the red, white blood cells, the red blood cells, the platelets all get pushed down. Because they're heavier. And then what you're left with is a straw-colored liquid that we call plasma. Right? And we already went through what was in the plasma and what's in the form elements already, right? So this here is a nice little summary table. So this is a good one to take a note of, right? And we already spoke about albumin and how albumin maintains osmotic pressure, right? I remember why osmotic pressure is important. Water balance, Right? If, there, if, if your blood is hypovolemic, hypo normally means you have um, too much of, of water, right? Or not enough of um, something else, basically, right? So if, you're, if your blood is, um, what am I saying? The other way around, sorry. If your blood is hypervolemic, where is it? There, there, there's too much pressure, right? When you have too much blood volume, it is harder for your heart to pump the blood around because, of course, it, the blood itself puts greater force on the heart itself. So in order for the heart to move, to circulate this, this larger volume of blood, it has to push more forcefully on the blood, which, of course, increases the chance of heart failure, right? So having too much blood is bad, right? Too much volume is bad. Of course, if you're 
hypovolemic now, which means your blood volume is too low. It's equally bad. Remember what I said to you. If your blood volume gets too low, your heart stops beating. Right? So you need albumin to help maintain your what we call osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure keeps the right amount of, of not only water, but it helps to keep the right amount of um, minerals in the blood so the blood is properly balanced. Right? Okay. Now, there are other plasma proteins in the blood that we didn't mention. And um, one of them is uh, would be lipoproteins. I don't know if you've ever heard of a lipoprotein, but lipo stands for lipid, and you know lipid is a fat, and protein. Now, you all should know from CSEC time that um, you cannot, when, when you're digesting fat, you break it down to fatty acid and glycerol. You can't put the fatty acid and glycerol into the blood because it will not dissolve in the blood properly. As then, as we've been told all our lives, oil and water don't mix. So in order to transport fatty acid and glycerol, you have to connect the fatty acid and glycerol to a protein. And then that protein can go into the blood carrying the fat. That is the lipoprotein. It's a fat carrier, right? That is one of the things that you need your lymphatic system for. Which we'll talk about later. We already mentioned the importance of globulins, right? Um, you guys are going to be doing a lot more in terms of um, immune system. You're all nurses. But be aware that there are different types of antibodies, right? So Ig here stands for immunoglobulin. So you have IgG, IgE, IgD, IgM, and IgA. These are all different categories of antibodies, right? Please remember, Ig is, is for immunoglobulin, which is for antibodies. Now, we already looked at the fibrinogen as well. Now, in addition to having plasma and form elements, there's something else we can get from the blood, which is called serum, right? What you basically do with serum is that you allow, you take the blood out of the, the patient and then you trigger blood clotting. So the platelets get exploded. They cause the, fibr the fibrinogen to form fibrin and it traps the red blood cells. And at the end of the day, what you're left with is serum. Right? Serum, unlike plasma, will not contain fibrin, fibrinogen. Right? Now, it also shouldn't contain a lot of antibodies either. So what is what is what is serum good for? Serum contains plenty of hormones, same way. And as you guys know, um, there are hormones in the blood associated with blood clotting that you can extract from serum and use to treat people with um with blood clotting disorders, right? So even in Jamaica, we can do this where we can extract serum from a normal person and inject a person who has a blood clotting disorder with it. Um, go ahead, Tessinic. So serum is like you get a cut and you trip and then the blood. There's no more blood, but there's just that clear white fluid, yellow fluid. All right, well, but remember now, um, we're, 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 we're differentiating between serum and plasma first, right? So plasma is going to contain fibrinogen, right? I know it as the plasma, so when you're saying the serum, I was like, it's not the plasma. Right, no, no, pla no. Um, all right, if you, when you just centrifuge the blood, right? Mm -hmm. What was my centrifuge? When you centrifuge the blood, what you left with is plasma. The fluid itself still contains the fibrin, right? And some other things. But if you want to get rid of the fibrin, you have to let the blood clot. So you can't centrifuge it. You basically have to put in a chemical in there that forces the blood to clot up. And as the blood clots, it uses up the platelets and it uses up the fibrin in it. So what you're left with is serum, which is different from plasma. Remember, serum does not have fibrin in it, whereas plasma 
does have fibrin in it, right? So they're not the same thing. And normally, it is a serum that is used when you're extracting um, hormones for treating blood clotting disorders, right? All right, this, this, this um, slide here now shows you what you're normally expected to find in normal blood. These, of course, are electrolytes, right? Well, some of them anyway. Glucose is not an electrolyte. So a normal person, if you take their fasting blood sugar level, it should be between 70 and 110 milligrams per deciliter, right? But does that make sense? If I say milligrams per deciliter, everybody understands that? Okay, I don't hear no, sir. It's, it's a measure. It's the way it is measured. Yes. I just want to make sure you understand what, what it means. So everybody understands what it means. So we can move on, right? Okay. Then now... Okay, you broke right up there. Um, Come again. I didn't hear a word of it. She said this would repeat. Okay. What I'm saying is that an, in normal blood, when you check the fasting glucose level, you should have a glu glucose level of between 70 and 110 milligrams per deciliter of blood, right? I was asking that if everybody understands what a milligram per deciliter means. I mean, you're, I assume you all know since you're all nurses, right? Sir, um, you're more familiar with uh, millimoles. Um, okay. So if you want to get 10 millimoles, you divide it by 18. All right. But you understand what a deciliter thing means, right? So a deciliter mm -hmm. is, is... Go ahead. Uh, you're very low. You want to see the picture of the centrifuge? I think that's what you said. What you, what, I think what you had said about the centrifuge is... You mean this? Remember, the centrifuge is just there to it, it spins the test tube with um, the blood in there. And it forces the um, form elements down to the bottom of the test tube because they're heavier. And then what you're left with then is plasma and the form elements separately. Right? So that's the purpose of the centrifuge, just to spin the blood down. So that you can get the, get to the plasma. And remember, that is different from the serum, which you you made a serum clot, the blood clot, to get the serum, right? Please don't mix them up. All right. Then we have sodium. A normal sodium level in the body is between 135 and 145 um, MEQ per liter. Right? Milli equivalent. Say it for me. Milli equivalent per liter. Mm-hmm. So a milliequivalent per liter, right? So I'm glad you're all familiar with all of these terms, right? Now, these days we know that high sodium levels do not cause high blood pressure. I think, I don't know if you all are still being taught this, but um, salt intake is not the cause of high blood pressure. We've been told it for, for, for the last couple of decades, now, um, we know for a fact it does not really cause it, right? So keep that in mind. Normally what happens is that very salty food, you also tend to have food that is very, very high in things like cholesterol, um, which, which is more likely to form plaques, right? And that, of course, can lead to high blood pressure. But the salt by itself is not that important, right? There, there are cultures around the world that consume far more salt than... than um than your average Western person or Caribbean person. And their levels of high blood pressure are much lower than ours. So we know it's not the salt. It's not even cholesterol. In general, it's a kind of cholesterol. As a matter of fact, um, it's a bit of a tangent, but I'll just mention it. It seems like cholesterol actually from grains is worse for us than cholesterol from meat. So frying food in a whole heap of oil is worse 
right? So French fries are bad for you because you're frying them in vegetable oil, as, a, as an example. It's not the salt in the French fries, it's the vegetable oil. Anyway, let's continue. Then, of course, calcium, 8.5 to 10. And half is fine and chloride. I won't, I won't go through all of them, but you can, you can see the table here, right? So, obviously, what I'm asking you to do is ensure that you know what normal levels look like for electrolytes, right, in the blood. It's something that can come up either in the blood section of things or later on in the electrolyte section of things, right? And besides, as nurses, you all need to know these things anyway, right? Anyway, let's continue. So our erythrocytes, our red blood cells. Now, you all know um, red blood cells are unique blood cells for a couple of reasons. One of them is the shape. There are no other um, cells in the body shaped like a red blood cell. And we call the red blood cell shape a biconcave disc, right? Basically, it's flat like a button, but it's um it is um um there's an impression on either side of it. It's depressed on either middle, I should say. Right? Now the shape of that is extremely important. The shape of that red blood cell is going to allow that red blood cell, here we go, to squeeze through capillaries more easily. Right? So that funny donut shape is it, it has a purpose which we'll talk about more later, right? I'm, I'm assuming I'm telling you things you already know, right? So it shouldn't be too, too much. Now, your red blood cells, as you know, I'm sure, are made in your um, bone marrow. You normally find the bone marrow, as I'm sure you know it too, for AMP1, in the long bones and in the flat bones of the body, right? Um, they are created from cells called proerythroblasts. Pro, of course, is basically means early. So a pro erythroblast is like the or the early stage of your of your erythroblast, right? And uh, and they divide to form. Um, we won't go through every individual stage, right? Just be aware of the pro erythroblasts leading to the formation of your red blood cells, right? We're not going to spend too much time looking at the, the individual stage of the red blood cells. When you're on the hematology, you can do that, right? Just to be aware, bone marrow from pro blasts you end up with your erythrocyte. And you, the pro blast starts out with a nucleus, but the, bad, but the red blood cell loses the nucleus, then gets filled with hemoglobin, right? Now, the blood cell itself doesn't live, I mean, it lives about 120 days, right? But normally, before it dies a natural death, that red blood cell, once it gets old, is broken down in the spleen, and, and you break it down for a very simple reason. In order to make the hemoglobin, you need to put iron in the hemoglobin, as everybody knows, right? But this iron is a useful product. Not only is the iron useful, it's not everything you'll find in nature that has iron in it, right? So that the iron isn't just um, afloat in all the foods we consume. So what happens is that your body recycles the iron because it never knows when you're going to get more. So when the red blood cell gets old, it goes now to your spleen where it is broken up Right? The hemoglobin is broken down to give you bilirubin. And bilirubin goes to the liver and eventually ends up um, being excreted. You take the iron out of the hemoglobin while you're doing this. And you send that back to the bone marrow to make more iron. What that, of course, means, I mean, is that you still have iron floating around in your body that you consumed when you were a baby. Because your body is just recycling it. That said, every time you bleed, you're going to lose some amount of iron, which of course means that females lose more iron than males on average, right? Because, of course, of menstruation. That said, um, 
I do find that y'all exaggerate the amount of blood you lose. It is normal for a female to lose between 23 tablespoons equivalent of blood per cycle. Yes, Driven. Sir, I wanted to ask you, Um, mm -hmm. you said the red blood cells are broken down in the spleen, right? Mm -hmm. So for persons well, who... Liver too. Oh, the liver too? Yeah. All right, because I was going to ask for persons who like lose their spleen, what the body does in that case. Yeah, when you lose your spleen, there, there, there are complications. One of them has to do with recycling. Um, also, the spleen is where we store blood as well as extra um, platelets. So if you lose your spleen, you tend to um, have a greater risk of having bleeding disorders. Sir? Yes. Um, sorry. Um, did you say we exaggerate when we're losing blood and not see, right, sir? Yeah, it's like two or three tablespoons worth. You're so lies, sir. You don't know. I am telling you, listen. It oh, looks like you plenty, know. but no, you tell us. no, but no, hold on. Yeah, if, you, no. if you drop a drop of ink in a liter of water, it colors the water. The water. So it looks uh -huh. like plenty, no. but it's still a drop. Mm -hmm. I don't sir, sir. It just looks okay. plenty. It's Compared not. To, the to something else, please. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is, an average female is two to three tablespoons. Of blood. Sir, it's just like the blood sir, colors everything. Sir, that is not true. You gotta look it up in it. Let me make it up. No, sir. But, but it's, it's, a, it's a scientific fact. Average. You can look it up. A sanitary napkin holds about 50 mils at least. Yes, but 50 mils of <laughs> what? It is mostly interstitial fluid. As I'm saying to you, it's interstitial fluid colored by blood. That's what it mostly is. Right? But, you know, sir, for the females who are not average, like for some females who have PCOS, our, sometimes... Our, our, our cystic fibrosis, are there, there are different diseases that can... Um, our cysts, fibroids. But we're talking about a normal, right? Normal female, yeah. two, three tablespoons. If you have cystic fibrosis, then you can lose... Um, up to a oh, third of a right. pint. Yes, because some people bleed for like a whole month. Yeah, that is more. very much not normal. A period is not supposed to last more than five days. And five days is long. Right? So, yeah. So, sir, so some sir, this okay, so and... one second. Somebody asked about the clots. The clots are endometrial tissue. But you produce it over the course of 28 days and you lose it. Right? Anyway, when, when we get to reproduction, we talk more about that and some of the funny things people do. Anyway. um, Any other question before we move on to? Because we're almost out of time. All right. So, as I said to you, we're not going to kill you too much on the different um stages the red blood cell has to go through before it gets fully functionless. Remember, proethroblast with a nucleus and this is what forms your erythrocytes. During the process, you lose the nucleus and you produce hemoglobin. The red blood cell lives about 120 days. When it gets older, it gets damaged. It gets taken out by the spleen, mainly, but the liver can do it too. And it is broken down to get and the heme is taken out and recycled to get that iron, which goes back to make more blood cells, whereas the what is left of the heme is converted to bilirubin, all right, which can go to the liver, which can go into the bile, or it can also end up in the urine in some cases, right? So that is the life cycle of your red blood cell, basically, in a nutshell, right? Now, this is showing here the formation of different types of blood cell, not just red blood cell. So we can see this lovely cell here called a myeloid stem cell. And all this myeloid stem cell leads to the formation of pretty much all of the types of blood cell you will find. So the myeloid stem cell will form the proethroblast, and then that one will form your erythrocytes. It will even form the cells that form the platelets. 
and I'll mention them in a little bit, right? Um, we have about five minutes left, so um, let me up. All right, functions. This one, everybody knows, oxygen transport. Now, water, lots of things dissolve easily and readily in water, but oxygen is not one of them. Only about two, on average, water holds 2% oxygen, right? Which is not great. You can't survive on 2% oxygen. The oceans and lakes are a little different. The reason why there's more oxygen in our ocean is because you have the whole, the whole weight of the atmosphere presses down on the water, right? And that forces more oxygen into the water. So the um the atmospheric pressure means that there's more there's what there's oxygen for fish to breathe. If that makes sense to you, right? But in non normal circumstances, without the whole force of the atmosphere pressing down, you're not gonna get more than two percent oxygen. So you need now, of course, a means of transporting the oxygen, and that is where hemoglobin came in, right? And until hemoglobin was discovered, or, or, some, or, or, or something like this, land-based animals weren't a thing, right? Okay. Now, carbon dioxide can also be transported in um, hemoglobin. Around 23% of it that forms something called carbaminohemoglobin, which we'll talk about later. But a lot of carbon dioxide can still dissolve in blood too, right? Around 8% or 7%. Here is your lovely hemoglobin molecule. Now, be aware, hemoglobin, as we said, is a protein. And this protein has four chains. We have two chains that are called alpha chains and two chains that are called beta chains. Now, imagine each one of these chains as a, um, basically a, 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 a thick cord. Uh, what do I have around here? Think of it like this, okay? So the chain starts out nice and long. And then the chain folds up. And as the chain folds, it folds itself to form in the middle of itself an area for the, hemo for, um, the iron. And we call this the heme group, right? So the heme group is in the folded chain. Now, four of these folded up, attached to each other, means, of course, you're going to get four um, heme groups. The heme group contains the iron, and this is the iron that holds on to the oxygen. So each hemoglobin molecule can therefore hold four oxygen molecules, all right? And there are millions of blood cells, uh, millions of uh, mil millions upon millions of um, hemoglobin molecules in your um, red blood cell. Around four to five million of them, right? And then, now, of course, you have trillions of red blood cells. So this says here, an adult male has forty-six million. Um, blood, red blood cells in one microliter or one mil of blood. Four and a half to six and a half million in a mil. Female, 4.2 to 5.5, right? Now, I want to stop here, but before I stop, I'm going to ask this question. Why is it there are more red blood cells in the male and the female and the female has to go through menstruation? That doesn't make sense. Why males have more? So, you know, they can pick it up. Is it a way of acting that the female first and will be more oxygen in the entire you know, the... Probably more so than oxygen. You need more oxygen for what? More oxygen in the entire blood. You know, yeah, but why though? Why? What was the underlying reason? What do males have more of than females do that requires that extra oxygen? Muscle. Muscle. Your average male and average female, even if they're the same height and the same weight, the average male will have more muscle. And that muscle needs extra oxygen. All right? 
So logically speaking, the males are going to need more blood, um, red blood cells eat per microliter of blood. All right. Last one, I said that other one was the last one, but we have two of the same kind of slides. So let's get to the one. A single drop of whole blood contains 260 million red blood cells. So one drop of blood is 260 million cells. An adult has around 25 trillion red blood cells. And around 5 million hemoglobin molecules in each one. The number is ridiculous. Can't even contemplate how big that number is. Right? Anyway, so we're going to stop here. And we'll pick this up.